This is a pleasure. I get to talk to someone who's from Chicago like I am. He was born here back, we're not going to say what year. <clears throat> he went on to play at USC. He played with the Vikings and Rams. He was a seven-time Pro Bowler, Pro Football of Famer, Ron Yari. How are you doing, Ron? Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thanks for having me on your show. Uh, I love Chicago. It's one of the great cities in America. You went to USC when John McKay was there. <clears throat> what was that like? It, it was a great time to play football at SC. Uh, I don't know what it's like today to play on college football, but you, you could not pick a better school uh, to have spend four years to have a, a, a great college experience. The faculty, the student body, uh, the athletes there, and all sports, it was a very close-knit uh, group and uh, once you graduated from there, you were you knew you you attended a school that was really more important than yourself. And uh, I, I, it's still the same way today. I talk to people who graduate from there, and they have a, a great affinity for for their for that school. And uh, they're they're you just fall in love with the place. I don't know what it is. It's located in a very tough area of Los Angeles. The neighborhoods that surround it are uh, very, uh, very dangerous. But uh, uh, the school, they just leave that school alone. And I think uh, USC got the school of the millennium. That's 100 years. And uh, they, they won it as a university. They beat Harvard, Yale, and everyone. Of course, if it had been Harvard or Stanford or someone, it would have been front page news. But... USC uh, got that award, and uh, uh, the reason they received it was because they had all of their curriculum and all of their programs and all their studies was to go out into the community and to help your community become a better community. Uh, all of their all of their work was for local residents and 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 people in LA to help men start businesses. Uh, help them their businesses succeed in in all aspects of life and living. So it was it's a great place to, to if you're going to have a kid go to college. It's, USC is a great place. By the way, the incoming freshman the G, average GPA is four point six four. Okay, so it's not an easy school to get into. They just cut athletes breaks. They're, they've got a lot of very bright kids going to that school, and uh, uh, you can't get in with a 3.92 because I've tried to help a couple kids by writing letters of recommendation that they're all at uh, AP classes they took, but you can't get in there with a 3.92. Yikes. Yeah, school. Now, when you That's started why I had C. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was a C minus student. Go ahead. <laughs> when you started off at Southern Cal, you were a defensive lineman. Yes. And you were all Pac-8 defensive lineman of the year. How'd you end up on the offensive line? What happened was all of our offensive linemen were seniors my sophomore year, and they lost everyone, so they moved me to offensive tackle, strong side tackle. That then they flipped lines the left and right, you played both way sides with the I formation. And uh uh they told me my, after my junior year, my senior year, that they were going to play me both ways, which really got me excited. But they never did. And uh we were winning and we we're having a really good year. So I thought I guess they thought it wasn't necessary, but I uh I was really disappointed. They didn't probably play both sides of the ball. Well, we talked to Frank Gifford. He mentioned that he was friendly with John Wayne. I think John Wayne tried to recruit him to USC, which he eventually went to USC. Did John Wayne recruit you? <laughs> no, uh, he didn't. Nobody recruited me except the coaches. Uh, no former player came out or called me or anything. It was uh, – I was, uh, I think, maybe on the borderline of the kind of guy that they'd want. So I went to Cerritos College for a semester, and I got good grades I, in high school. I took all 
the courses, prep college courses, math and science and everything. But uh, uh, for me, I needed to go to a junior college first. I was too immature with study habits and discipline and areas that are required for you to, to succeed in college. So I just wasn't ready for it. But uh, I, I think they sent me to a JC. You know, they, they, they wanted me to go to SC. They offered me a scholarship I didn't qualify to get in. And uh, I think they shipped me off the, 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 with the expectation that I would turn out to be okay. But if I didn't, they'd have an out. <laughs> so they, uh, that's, that's what happened. Now, when you got to Southern Cal, you, you had played fullback in high school. Couldn't you have told John McKay you wanted to be in the, in the offensive backfield? Uh, no. I <laughs> Playing fullback in high school was enough for me. I realized those guys get beat up. I was much more sore uh, after a game as a fullback than I ever was as an offensive lineman. You, know, you got nine guys coming at you, and I didn't. I wasn't. Uh, I couldn't run away from guys, and I wasn't that nifty. So it was either I run over them or through them, and so <laughs> that's the type of off fullback I was. But I was more of a blocking fullback as well. They they let me lead out on the plays to block the defensive end or block the outside linebacker. So they would use me more as a as a blocking fullback than a running back. You were a great blocker. You, I, got, you got your running back a Heisman Trophy when you were there. Uh, it's, you know, you don't never appreciated him and OJ until you played against him. I, to me, he was just another running back and, uh, was a good guy in college, even though everybody knows he committed horrible crimes, uh, afterwards, but he, uh, he was a very nice guy in college and it was very personable, very engaging with people and everybody liked him. Uh, but, uh, we know he never hung out with any of the players on the team. He was always, uh, I don't know where he was. Same with Mike Garrett. You know, you never, you never knew where they were. They were probably in Hollywood or something, hanging out with all the celebrities. The guys that had to work uh, stayed in the dorms. Was the offensive scheme fairly, uh, I don't want to say simple, but not overly complicated because, you know, USC was known for student body right and student body left, and uh... they they like to exaggerate that. But uh, McKay likes to run at people, and uh, you run at them, and if it works, it works. You know, they didn't have the quarterbacks that they have today. They don't didn't have the six three, six five quarterbacks to throw fifty yards, and uh, it was old time football. It, you know, it was. You weren't any good unless you could run the ball. And I was raised in a uh, generation that that was your mental approach. If you were to throw a football, to it was an insult to the offensive line. It was it was like you were the reason we're throwing the ball is because we can't run the ball. And the reason we can't run the ball is because you're not good enough. It was just a, it was a big in, insult to you. So. Uh, that was kind of the way that SC approached it back then. I'm certain a lot of other colleges did as well, but uh, you know we were all we were focused on run blocking, and uh, turned out well. Real well. You won a national championship there at USC in '67. Yes, it, it, yes, it, it did. We had some pretty good teams there. Uh, great guys. Uh, some of my fondest memories about them are, you know, what we, things we did off the field as much as on the field. And, uh, I, mean, I can't speak enough. I, I hope my son turns out to be, I have an 11 year old son and I have an eight year old son. And I hope they both, uh, turn out to be good enough athletes that they could uh, attend that school because it's, it's more than just football there. It really is a, a good place to go. And, uh, I just, I think I think I am. I think I've got two. I got a couple of boys here who are going to be monsters. So you're not sending Notre Dame? Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> if they want to go there, they can go there. It's not my decision. Ultimately, it'll be theirs. But uh, 
Uh, I th- think they're going to they're going to be forces to contend with in, in athletics. Now, one of the reserve quarterbacks on those Southern Cal teams was a guy by the name of Mike Holmgren. Yes. First of all, I can't envision him as a quarterback. But that said, did you have any clue that this guy would have a great mind for football and go on to achieve what he has achieved as an NFL coach? I'm not surprised with Mike. Mike was a very smart guy. Uh, you know, we had some smart players on that team, excluding me, myself. Our two offensive guards were uh, became orthopedic surgeons. Uh, another guard got his master's in education. Uh, our two center, two of our was it two or one of our centers centers were became a dentist. And we had a lot of smart guys on the, those teams, and uh, uh, Mike was one of them. But you know, Mike was a throwing quarterback, and uh, they never gave him an opportunity to throw the ball. He, he had a heck of an arm. He could throw. I don't know. You know, I was too busy worried about what I had to do and not about what everybody else was going to do, But I, so I don't know what happened. But uh, I do, you know, Mike was there when I was there. He was a freshman or a sophomore my senior year, and uh, he was, he's, a, he's a funny guy. He was... Everybody loved Mike because he, he had a great sense of humor. Uh, you could take the worst situation and make it into something you could really laugh about and uh, enjoy. So you always need guys on teams like that. And Mike had that great quality. And I think that's why he came through as him as a coach. He was able to uh, get the player to play up to their ability because of that. He's a, he was really a player's coach. I, I can, I, 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 I'm certain of that. Talking about OJ, Joe DeLamalur told me that OJ Simpson had a bigger he- helmet than he did, bigger head than he did, and he was very conscientious about that. So he said, Watch during the trial. You'll see he never wants them to get a clear picture of his head because you'll see how big it is. Was he that conscious about his head size? I was too tired to look at the size of his head. <laughs> <laughs> I was working too hard. I never noticed whether or not he had a big head or big foot. Or uh, uh, if he was running hard, or was or is, is dogging it. I was too involved in what I was doing to evaluate anyone else. You know, I do know this. He never had a locker room in, in with all the other guys. Yeah, I think he had his own locker room. He'd run off the field and he had his own place to go. That was strange. That's- Same with Mike Garrett. Mike, they never had Mike uh, hang out with the guys on the team. They were separate. You did all the work. I mean, look, you got the Outland Trophy your senior year, then you get drafted number one by the Vikings. That had to be a thrill for you. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. I just, I did my best. I had great coaches. It, you know, it was a. It has to be the type of draft for an offensive lineman to be picked first as well, like this year as well. If they had had uh, a uh, Joe Montana, maybe, or a, uh, a John Elway or someone like that, it, it, it could have been a different draft. Yeah, but you, you were the first offensive lineman ever, the, the number one overall pick in the draft. And Yeah, that, uh, yeah that's because I think, I think if you're going to take a uh, a position, and you're going to evaluate this to uh, to determine the outcome of of his career, what kind of a player he's going to be. Uh, I think it's easier to assess an offensive lineman uh, more than any other position on on the field. And I I think it's a safe investment to make when you pick an offensive lineman because of that. And when you're uncertain about other positions, they've had a lot of uh, bad experiences with drafting quarterbacks high in the drafts. I know that they've had a lot of disappointments. But I think there's only maybe one or two offensive linemen that they've been disappointed with in, in the draft. You know, you don't know how – got to know how determined the guy is uh, to play the game. Uh, a lot of guys uh, – don't have that hunger 
once they graduate from from college to uh, to make a career out of it. And uh, it's it's a guy. You know, all the you know we the the, the oh, our left tackle was a dentist as well, Chuck Arobio. He was very smart as well. He uh, our, our strong side tackle, and uh, uh, he 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 went to the Vikings for a couple of years and decided it's not worth it, and went in and became a dentist and uh, has had a great life as a dentist. And most of these other guys have done the same thing. They you know they found alternatives or vocations that. They meant more than football to them. Kind of like your defensive tackle, Alan Page. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, maybe Alan. I don't know about that, but uh, uh, Alan would be certainly be one of them. He made something of himself after football. Those practices had to be intense, though, going against those purple peep leaders. It, it was uh, like any other team, I suppose. You know, what makes a great football team is – how do they handle adversity? And we didn't like to lose. And I knew that if we lost, the practice the, on the following week would be worse than the game because everybody would be angry at themselves, not angry at one another, but angry at our, each of ourselves for losing the game. We were, we were mad at ourselves for letting the game slip away. And, I, and once that, the team developed that quality, it was a tough thing to overcome by other teams. And uh, once we lost that quality, the team began to lose. We, we, no. we weren't replacing that type of a guy with the type of a guy that uh, would, would get mad at himself if they lost. You know, I mean, you, you, can't, you can't be happy losing. No. Now, the Vikings had the number one pick because they made a trade with the New York Giants in which the Vikings gave away, they didn't give away, Fran Parkington went from the Vikings to the Giants. Was there added pressure because Parkington had sort of been the face of the Vikings since their inception? And and here's this new kid in town, and what was the expectation coming into the league? You know, I didn't care about what their expectation was. It was I was going to do what I was going to do, and that's it. I mean, I'm going to live in my world, not in theirs. And uh, what their expectations were, or, or what you know, they wanted me to do. I was going to do what I was going to do, uh, and I knew what I could do. I knew my limits. I knew how good I could be, and I I played the game. The other thing is, I loved the game. I loved playing football. I would not have rather done anything other than football. Uh, it's the only thing in my life that I have done that. I felt that way towards, and now being a dad is is, a, is another. But up until this point, uh, it's it's it was all me. Uh, everything, you know. I loved going to work in the morning. I loved going to practice. I enjoyed hanging around the, the that type of people. Uh, it was a simple life. It wasn't complex. Uh, you didn't. You knew your outcome. You knew whether you succeeded or failed immediately in your work assignment. It's not like many other occupations where you, you could go for six months and, and not know whether or not you're going to get the job or succeed or not. It's Your rewards are known immediately to you, and you can correct them immediately as well. So you, you, can't, you can't find a better way to make a living in America than sports. It's... It's ideal. When you hear these guys talk about all the pressures involved, that's not true. Uh, to me, I hear that, and I just I don't understand that. You, know, you go to work every day. You, you can't. You, you set your own goals. You, you reach your goals. Uh, you make a lot of money. You meet a lot of girls when you're that age, and if you're not married, you, you know you have a lot of opportunity to meet a lot of girls. What more can you ask for in life at 22, 24? A former player told me the smartest thing you could do when you get drafted to play in the NFL is not get married till after your career is over because there's too many temptations out there. That's true. I've seen a lot of tragedies and marriages because of, of things that went on like that. And uh, so I, I, I was married at 
24, divorced at 26. Perfect example of that. I was a bad husband. I was not a, a good husband. I had a great wife. And I didn't get married again until I was 51 because I knew I was, could not, uh, I just, that failure just ruined me for a long time. There are many Maybe reasons for that, but that's not why I'm here to talk about. All right. Moving from one legendary coach at the USC, you encounter another one with the Vikings and Bud Grant. What was he like? Fran Tarkenton once said that if you can't play football for Bud Grant, you can't play for anyone. We all agreed on that. Uh, Bud had his ways about him that you know may, may not have liked, but you could live with him. There wasn't anything he asked of you in terms of regimen or discipline that wasn't uh, you know, wasn't something that he just could not accept. And uh, uh, he had a, made it clear what he expected of your of you as a player. Uh, what was what was a good performance and what was a bad one. And he never embarrassed you either. You know, he never insulted you. In front of your teammates, uh, and, and he had the ability when he was talking about uh, when he stand up in front of the team and, and speak to you. He made it feel like it sounded. He had that great skill. All great orators can do that when they talk to you. It, it's like you're having a personal conversation with them. So that that was one of his uh, great qualities. And, and he let the coaching go to the assistant coaches. He let our assistant coaches make decisions on the field. So it made them feel like I suppose they were had a part in the success of the team. So he, he was a great coach to play for. The only thing that, as I reflect back on, that bothered me was that the fact that they set me on the bench my first year. Uh, that I, to this day, I can't accept and uh, I'm angry about. When I think about my back, thinking back, I just felt that I should have started day one. Why was that? Why should've. did they sit you on the bench? Was it just he didn't want to give rookies playing time? I, I have no idea. If, if that had been today, with, uh, I would not have accepted that. I would have told him either get rid of me or put me on the field because I'm not going to sit on the sideline. Because you make the front office look bad because they spent the first pick in the draft on you and you're sitting on the bench. It looks like they drafted the wrong player. Yes, I know. I know. I don't know. I I really don't know why. But I'll say this. Bud had the same uh, offensive scheme that Francis had. Uh, I mean, uh, Norm Van Brocklin. And uh, except he changed the plays. He moved the odd numbers to the right and the even numbers to the left. Under Van Brocklin's system, even was to the right and odd was to the left. And uh, when I played the college all-star game, every play that we learned there was exactly the same plays that, that Bud had, except they were re- reversed. And because I came in, I was backing up uh, Doug uh, Davis and uh, uh, Grady Alderman. I was behind them. Uh, it's a third tackle in, in training camp. When they'd run a play, I would, uh, I would be thinking sevens to the right, but when you're tired and you're fatigued, uh, you know, that's what you gotta, you gotta, it's hard to work through when you're fatigued. So I made a couple mistakes, and, uh, I think it's because of that. He didn't, I, I can't think of any other reason. But I would, today I would probably quit the team and walked off before I would have allowed that to, to stand as I think about that. So I'm going to go somewhere where they need a tackle. Don't put me well, on the I, bench. Yeah, I think today they, a team would do whatever it could to get the, the number one pick onto the field. Otherwise, it makes the uh, the general manager look a little uh, like he's not know what, what he's doing and makes the coach look like he doesn't know what he's doing. So it, I don't know. I'm starting to get criticism my second year out there. But... Uh, that ended. Yeah, I mean, seven Pro Bowls, six-time first-team All-Pro, and you guys were in the Super Bowl four times. You were doing something right. 
Well, you know, really, uh, I really don't like sitting on the bench. I'm so angry about my first year. You, you know, you think about the past, that's one thing that always will sit with me. And then, uh, uh, so that's about my, that's the, my sole complaint in my life as a football player. That's pretty good. That's not, a great not life. Bad. Not bad. bad. Now, when, now, when you start off with the Vikings, Joe Kaplan was the quarterback, and then you had Gary Quazzo. And then in 72, Tarkenton comes back to Minnesota. What was it like trying to block for a guy who scrambled the way that Tarkington did? Well, it, it, it helped our team. Uh, it, it was a big benefit to our team because he could scramble. If you scramble and you and you, you you're incapable of doing that, then it's going to make everybody put them in a bad position. But Francis had that great ability to scramble, so we were able to capitalize on that talent he had. But from an offensive right tackle, I didn't like it because he liked to scramble to the right, and he liked to drift to the right. If you go look at the end zone films of Francis when he was playing, uh, he would drift to the right and throw behind the right guard, we, even when he set up on a, on a pass. And so I, I changed my style of play once I found that out. It was, I think, maybe two or three years after Francis got, came to the team, they put an end zone camera in, and I noticed he was drifting to the right when he set up. And so I stopped going using the normal drop-back technique to taking guys on sooner on the line of scrimmage. So I became a short uh, pass block blocker uh, rather than the regular drop back type of guy. I had to be more aggressive with the defensive end because I couldn't let him get a field because he'd be in the face of the quarterback because he was thrown behind the right guard. So uh, that little nuance changed the way I played, which I didn't care, you know. I just, you know, he, he just always ran to the right, and I didn't have eyes in the back of my head, so I couldn't see where he was moving. And uh, if I knew where he was, I, I wouldn't care, because then I could do something about it. But when you begin to move, and, as a, and your quarterback is moving, and that's not where you practice it, or you're, you're aware of where he's going to be, it, it uh, makes it more difficult then that's the problem with the scrambler. But if there was some way you, you, you could uh, determine where he's going to run, that would be great. Was there one Super Bowl that you felt that you guys had a better chance than the others of winning? I thought our best one was the Raiders. Uh, and I thought their First one with Kansas City was good as well. You go and thinking you can win them all, but uh, I thought the Raiders we had the best opportunity to beat them, and uh, uh, you know we just never did very well in those games. The teams were better; they deserved to win. So, what more can you say? I'm happy for them. Now, in 1980, uh, you had injury problems, but you also had what I have to assume is one of the highlights in that you had the only reception of your career, good for five yards. Do you remember that play? I'm sorry, what was that? I didn't hear you. Okay. In 1980, when you were hurt, that it also provided, I think, one of the highlights of your career when you had a reception, good for five yards. Do you, do you remember that tackle eligible play? It wasn't a tackle eligible. It was a, they, on short yardage, they would move me to tight end a lot. And they had a couple plays that they were going to throw me passes, but they never did. I don't remember them throwing me a pass for five yards. I don't think it was well, me. <laughs> Okay, well, that's just your statistics. Thing. I don't know. I don't think they ever threw me a pass. I, I, we were on the short yardage against the 49ers in the NFC Championship game, and uh, I went on a pass. They'd thrown it to me. I'd have caught it. We'd have scored a touchdown. 
but it was Norm Sneed was our quarterback, and he threw the ball out of bounds and was a few seconds left in the fourth quarter, and we lost the game. So, but uh, I was never – they never threw to me. I wish they had. Who was the toughest defensive lineman you went up against? Uh, in the beginning, I didn't think anybody was any good. Uh, in the end of my career, everybody was great. You now, because you're, you, you know, you, you're tired of going into the rut every year, having to prove yourself, and it's, it's more the regimen that defeats you than the person. To tell you the truth, uh, I'd have to say if I picked out the lineman, I'd, I'd say uh, Jack Youngblood was good. Uh, Vern didn't hurt her. Uh, played tough against me. I knew when I played against him, he's from Minnesota. I didn't know that when he was playing. I couldn't figure out why he came so hard against me. I could tell why. He was hes a Minnesota boy. But in high school, when I probably started playing, he was really good. And uh, I think who else? Uh, God, a lot of guys just slipped my mind. I'm old. Can't remember who I played against anymore. You had the Dan Hamptons later on in your career. Yeah, Dan was a good lineman as well. He was strong, and uh, I think he was better when they moved him to the inside. I think he was a better defensive tackle than a defensive end. That that was a smart move on their part. And, uh, guy, who else? Guy. Your defensive coordinator from the Vikings basically built that bear defense and Buddy Ryan. Yeah, Buddy Ryan beat the uh, – set the – yeah. Well, he didn't set the Vikings defense. He, he did with the Bears. With the Bears, right. The Vikings, yeah, with the Bears, not with the Vikings. So, uh, but, uh, you know, he didn't have a long career as a coach either. Uh, how many years was he there? Six or seven or eight? No, yeah, then he, he he went to coach the Eagles, and then he was with the Oilers, Arizona, and then he's been out of football. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, anyway, that's. I don't. I didn't follow too much, but uh, he was our defensive line coach. But the, the defensive line was already built by Jack Patera. There, Jack left and went to Seattle as a head coach there. But Jack was—he's uh, the one who picked all these guys and had a lot to do with developing them in the beginning. They were already into their peak of their careers when uh, the buddy took over. When Chuck Foreman came to the Vikings, it, it sort of signaled a new era because up to that point you'd had, you know, the Bill Browns, the Dave Osborns, and Chuck brought a, a little more versatility to the backfield. And also there was a guy uh, who went on to an acting career, Ed Marinaro. As a tackle, did you have to make adjustments to, to the personnel in that backfield? No, it actually made it, Chuck made it a lot easier. I mean, he hit the hole so quick, and he was so fast down the field that uh, he uh, he just made made blocking a lot easier for everybody. That's what great running backs do. They make a good uh, you know a, an average block into a great block, and Chuck could hit a hole as fast as any guy I've ever seen. Uh, I remember the first time he came in. We we ran the first play we ever ran with Chuck was uh, a four thirty five, and uh, he was through that hole so fast that in five years down five years on the field I uh, I was amazed I said my God he's going to help our team and he did Chuck uh, he had great speed and it also could you know had a great roll when he came to uh, to the Vikings they'd hit him and he'd roll out of it do a three sixty roll to move down the field. He was very good. And you had a so, good receiver went on to, I call it an acting career. I mean, he's a sportscaster, Ahmad Rashad. We had a lot of great receivers. We had Gene Washington as well. Sammy we White. had John Gilliam, uh, Sandy White, uh, Sammy White, uh, John Gilliam. He was another great receiver. We had we had great players on that team. You know, if, it, if there was a weak spot that we had on that team, it was probably our offensive line. We had a good set of linebackers, uh, good defensive backs. Probably the weakest uh, set we had was offensive line. Right. We had Ed White. 
and he's a Hall of Famer, and so is Mick. But I'm just saying, it's still it was, our weak spot was our offensive line. Getting elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, what was that induction like for you? It's uh, it's a very humbling experience that is a great culmination to your life and a career that you loved. Uh, if you didn't love football and you go in the Hall of Fame, it's a big deal. But if you really love the game and wanted to play it your whole life and and then you get recognized as, you know, what, 50-some years old. It's, it really is a, it's like getting a Nobel Prize in science to a football player. And it's, Cam does such a great job uh, that weekend that it's, uh, it's a great place to, to have that whole event taking place because the whole town puts out for that event. And uh, nobody can give more than what people in Canton, Ohio do. I mean that. It's... It's just a, they make it worth the whole four days you're there. It's a, it's a big tribute and a great one. You know, when I'd go to a banquet, uh, I'd sit out in the, the audience. And uh, now I sit at the head table and they introduce me. So that's what the, that's the difference when you make the Hall of Fame. They think that you, there's, you have some insight about the game that, uh, uh, Nobody else has, which is not true. Uh, actually, you have less insight probably than most people, but uh, uh, they just, it's just, uh, that's how they honor you. You've become a big deal in life, I guess. I learned something when I went to the Hall of Fame, the ceremonies last year for the first time, that they put the number that you're inducted in the Hall of Fame in your gold jacket. What number are you? Uh, my number at the Vikings was 73. And I don't know if they put that number in my jacket or not. Oh, no, they, Hall put of Fame the, jacket. they put the number that you're elected to the Hall of Fame in your jacket, what number you went in. Oh, no, I, I don't think they players. did. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I can't remember that. That'd be, what, uh, 132 or 128 or something like that? Right. I, I think, think the, they, I think they, the they, oldest they living Hall that. of Famer right now is Chuck Benarek at the Eagles. Ah, Who is yeah, that guy's going to live to 200. <laughs> I've, I've met him. He's in good shape, Chuck. <laughs> he is. Concrete Charlie, they call him. <laughs> yeah, he is. Who was your favorite player growing up? I, I My favorite players were in baseball. And I didn't have a favorite football player. It, football wasn't as like it is today. It wasn't as uh, preeminent a sport. When I was a kid, uh, they, uh, I didn't, I didn't admire anybody in football. And when I was in baseball, I didn't admire anybody as well. I never admired anybody in sports when I was a kid. I, I admired everybody, but not any one to the exclusion of all others. Uh, I, I met Rulus Richter one time. He came to our market when, uh, I was eight years old and, uh, I was overwhelmed with him, and when I saw him, he kind of made me want to play the game and play football. And the reason was he had all these cuts all over his hands and over his forehead and his eyes. They were all scarred over, and he had all these nicks all over his arms and and his face. And I just thought that was the greatest thing I've ever seen. (laughs) I said, that's exactly what I want to be like, just like him. So... I bet he 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 was left there, and he never knew that I tried to go meet him some many years later after I got into the Hall of Fame to go say hello to him because he he got in last year I think or year before last, and he he's one that was overlooked. But he was a uh, really loved kids. I could tell when he was there at the market that uh, he really liked kids. He pulled me out, told me to go play football, and. Uh, made a big deal over me when I was uh, a young boy. And uh, I, w- I couldn't talk to him because I was taken back with his presence. But uh, I was, I was with the, with the, my tongue was tongue-tied. So uh, that was my introduction to football. It was more for to his appearance. And he was in a suit, 
and uh, wore a coat and tie, and uh, uh, I never forget it. I can see him as clearly today as when I was there as a young man. So he influenced me. What's it, what's it like having a football stadium named after you, as you do in the Bellflower, California? Kind of deserving because, uh, you know, I live so far away from my high school, I can't get involved with them. It's too much of a, a drive here in Southern California. They're only 40 miles away, but it's a five-hour drive, exaggerating a little. But it's, not it's, much. it's that bad. So anyway, uh, I, uh, uh, I'd like to be more involved with them, and uh, I can't because of my distance. But it's, it's you know, they, they had a coach there by the name of Don Ashton who uh, became the principal of the school and dedicated a great deal of his life uh, to that high school. And I, uh, he coached me there my junior year and my senior year. So I, uh, I, I really like Don, and I think they should have named the football stadium after Don, not myself. Uh, and that's, that's another one of the injustices in life. You know, all I did was play f- football there for a few years, and, uh, he, he's one that encouraged me to go on, gave me the ability to go on. The talent, I might have had something to do with that, but uh, uh, he, he did that with a lot of kids. And uh, you should have named the stadium after him, not me. So you didn't pay for the naming rights to the stadium? <laughs> uh, uh, no, I didn't, and I'm going to, though. I, I keep saying i got to go back, and I intend to do that, though. They intend to, uh, I don't know, there, there's a plaque out front and it says Ron Yeri's Stadium there. I'm embarrassed to go there. But as we got a program going on, it's called the uh, Legacy Leadership Project, where we take high school athletes that have the ability to go on to college and to compete uh, on the college level uh, that are having, uh, need just a little guidance in high school. We get them on track, to let them know the what a wonderful experience you're going to have over the next four years. And uh, every year we bring back uh, uh, two kids from California. Last year the Denver Broncos were involved. The Vikings were involved. They sent a kid, and I think this year uh, the Panthers, Carolina Panthers, are going to send a team. We're trying to expand this uh, as we go along here. This is our, will be our fifth year or sixth year. And uh, uh, we'd like you to interview these kids. On your radio station, that would be great. That would because sound great. Uh, these, these are good kid, good kids that are good football players. And if you come up to me, we'd like you to bring a couple of them over. We could put them on your radio show and, and uh, talk to them. If we could get the Bears to participate in this, we'd have you could talk to a uh, high school uh, player. That, he goes right with all the players. These kids go right with us backstage. They go to all the events that the players do before. They go anywhere or do anything, and so they get a uh, they get a perspective on what it's like to be an NFL player that uh, you're not going to get without going there, and it it, it really uh, it, it puts them on the right path in life. So uh, it takes time. We spend a lot of time with them, but we want to get them on your show.